Hello, hello. Welcome to uh, welcome to B sides. There would be an introduction to the speaker, but we screwed around uh, and ate up that time, so we're going to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Michael Lewis. I'm Rukela. This is uh, Topher, and then uh, Joe is men Joe mentioned there, but didn't appear. That's fine. We'll just continue without him. <laughs> uh, so, firstly, we we have badges. Um, <clears throat> Oh my god, they, they fucking work. That's amazing. I, I really didn't think that was going to happen. Um, you can direct most of your complaints to me. So what is on the, on the badge? So this is a on the back, If for those of you who have a badge and are playing along at home. Uh, on the back is a NRF 52A32 uh, module. It's a Regato BMD300. These are really neat. These are really neat, tiny little BLE modules that um, they have a Cortex Arm, arm Four, or Cortex M Four inside, and um, they're really low power and really neat. And they're so small that you can actually embed them inside of an RSI Secure ID token. Um, there's a that's a different talk. Uh, <laughs> There's a neat little LLED screen, D-pads that mostly probably work. Um, you know, they all flash, but QA, uh, we didn't get a chance to actually to do QA, so the buttons maybe work. And you can like flip them through into a little, let's see if my button works, maybe. You can flip them through into a, a cute little like Sasquatch hunts cameras games. Uh, it's got two, two oxen, or an oxen docking connector and a wagon hitch. And a power switch that um, is a little bit flaky, and so if you flick it on and flick it off and it's still on, move your battery around a little bit, or accept the fact that it's always on. So, how did this happen? Um, so, if you went to Vegas and you were part of the DC 503 party, then this is sort of familiar to you. This looks very similar to the badge that Joe primarily designed. Um, the 503 trail which was amazing um, and we had this great idea that we were going to just recycle that design and then this wouldn't be such an epic clusterfuck like it always is and um, then we kind of had our Vegas hangover then we uh, said well you know wouldn't it be great if we had these like actually produced because it's really hard to solder these by hand and we knew that we were going to have a lot of people so we really need to make this, you know, to do design for manufacture, right? To design this to be producible by machine. So the DC-503 badge, we made 100 of them. And we had um, the really tiny parts uh, professionally assembled. And then the other parts, um, we drank uh, a lot of caffeinated beverages and hung out at Control H and just soldered them until we couldn't see straight. And we knew that we have way too many, uh, we have way too many people to do that and that um, we really would benefit from having a professional assembly. Uh, so that took a little longer than I thought it would. Um, and then there was, um, there was a lot of chaos, panic, and uh, ultimately despair. Uh, I won't go into the chaos and panic, but you can be sure that you know most of it was probably my fault. And it actually all came together on Wednesday. Um, I had sent the email to the assembly house saying, we have to come to reality here and that, you know, this just isn't going to happen. And we, this is all my fault and I accept this and, you know, we'll, we'll try to get badges out to people, you know, maybe a month after con. And they sent me back email saying, we're rolling, we're going to make deadline. <laughs> <laughs> So, an emotional roller coaster. Um, and then they called me a little bit later and said, hey, you know, uh, the battery is backwards. And you can't insert or remove the battery without ripping components off the board. And, and I th asked them, well, you know, how many have you assembled where we've identified this problem? And, and they wrote back 300. <laughs> Uh, and they said, "Well, you know, I, I think we can. I think we can hand rework all these. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll just, 
It, it'll just be a little bit of money and, and, and overtime. And, and, and I, I was unsure, but Dean said, yeah, let's do it. So unbelievably, amongst overcoming all obstacles, they assembled the doll. We picked it up on, uh, on, on Thursday afternoon. We assembled it all at control, you know, got the wheels on, the batteries, programming at control age, tested them, and oh my fucking God, they work, and we had 100% yield. This has never, ever happened to me before. <laughs> if, if someone told me that they, they did their badges and they got 100% yield, I would think that they like really planned everything really well and everything went according to plan. And I know that that's totally not true in this case. Uh, lots and lots of people, uh, lots and lots of people helped do this. Uh, and, and there are way too many to thank. There was an entire crew of people. Uh, there was an entire crew of people at Control H last night working feverishly hard. And, and it's amazing to see everyone come together. And I'm tremendously thankful for everyone to help make this happen. Okay. I mostly want, I most of all want to, want to thank, um, our sponsors, so Oshpark donated the PCBs, which, as per usual, are perfect purple PCBs. Uh, Regato donated the radio modules, and Cascade Systems heroically assembled this and donated the assembly. And um, I really just, again, want to say thank you to everyone. Um, oh, and uh, there's some sort of hacking you can do with the badge. I think you talked about that, right? No. Uh, oh, there's your a thing. Okay. You're the badge guy. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> there is a badge hacking contest. Uh, you should hack your badge. And there will be some sort of uh, judging ceremony later to be announced because I didn't plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will turn it over to Tover. <laughs> I'm going to interject so, before. So, so also, like, Joe finally came because the speakers wrangled the guy that's wrangling speakers. So yay, Joe. Yay. Um, I was going to say something. It was going to be relevant, but I don't remember what it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's been pretty cool to have badges every year. Um, so Osh Park has uh, donated the PCBs the past four years now. Um, this is the first year we had Regato support us by contributing the little modules, those tiny little modules in the back, and uh, CST uh, did the assembly. So it was really great to get all these different sources uh, helping us to make this happen. Um, they're all nice local companies that we really like. Um, and it's also really nice that Mike keeps doing it because every single year he says he's not allowed to do badge again. <laughs> and he does. And I don't actually... You're not, he's not allowed to badge again. Let's take, let's revisit this in a few months. <laughs> maybe he'll forget, or maybe everyone will also forget. But um, so yeah, that's it. Or maybe there's someone in the audience who's designed a really awesome badge in the past uh, year and would like to, you know, volunteer to be the new badge person. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you and uh, thanks, Mike. And here you go, Topher. So speaking of doing stuff, for some reason, Joe keeps asking me to do things, and I say yes without actually knowing what the role entails, um, one of which was leading all of the events and contests and building the CTF again this year. Um, so I mean, this is B-Sides. It's a security conference, so a big portion of what people come for are the, are the talks. But for people that you know don't want to go to every single talk and every single track, there's Typically, you know, other events and happenings going on so you can interact with other people or, you know, try out your hacking skills or whatever you want to participate in. So this year we actually have a really awesome uh, contest and event set up and is, you know, is common in a lot of um, hacker conferences these days. We have a really awesome CTF, which we'll talk about. So as far as the contests and events that are going to be happening for the duration of B-Sides, um, we have InfoSec Quiz Show. So this has been going on for a couple of years now. Um, last year was a huge success. How many people actually participated or watched this l last year? Yeah, a couple of people, great. So Steve's doing a really great job with this, and pretty much what it is is, you've, you've all seen the show Jeopardy, so think of this as Hacker Jeopardy. It's a series of questions and, and whatnot to the, to the competitors, but they all have you know, some sort of computer or security theme. So some of the questions are, you know, what's the best text editor? And the only answer, of course, is Vi. <laughs> 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 
Um, so, so it's fun. It's, you know, it's got some comedy aspect to it, um, and it's great. There aren't that many people currently signed up to be actual uh, competitors for it, so I encourage you to go to the B-Sides website and sign up to, to compete. Um, it's a lot of fun, and there's really awesome prizes that will be delivered during the closing ceremony. When is what? Oh, the quiz show. Yeah, so the quiz show is happening tonight at 5. It's like 5.15 to 6 or, or whenever it ends at. Um, it's on the schedule as well. Um, there's also this thing called Carmageddon that Dean's been running for the last two years. Um, how many people like Reddit here? How many people like shit posting? <laughs> you should play this game. <laughs> so the, the intention of this is essentially shitpost as much as you can on Reddit and collect all of the karma. And the person with the most karma wins and is the, you know, the best shitposter at B-Sides PDX. Um, I'm, lo I'm looking at one person in particular that should do pretty well at this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, sign up. There's also prizes for this. And then coming back this year, and this is an event that hasn't really been widely publicized, so it hasn't really taken off, but we as the organizers feel that there is merit to it, is this notion of a technical book swap. So like, you know, like all of you, I assume, I have books on my shelf that I've read that I will never pick up again because I've either gone through the material or it's no longer relevant for what I care about. And it would be cool from a community standpoint to be able to give that away to people or exchange it for another book that I want. Um, so this, this you know, informal event in the event room, there's a table next to all of the lanyards, um, which is also a cool thing that's like looking for work and looking to hire, uh, particularly for Portland hires. Um, so it's, you know, community driven, go, go through your resume on there, get hired. But also at the same time, there's the book swap happening on top of it to learn more technical skills or to give those skills to the community. So I encourage you, and I'm, I'm, it's likely that you didn't know about this today, but if, you know, going home tonight, you look at your shelf and there's some books that you'd want to contribute to this event, I encourage you to do so and put them on that event table. What, what do you consider recent? Um, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe don't have stuff about like, you know, X I net D. <laughs> it can be can be whatever. If somebody doesn't take it, it's you know take it back. Whatever. That sounds fun. <laughs> do, do you have books? <laughs> you should bring those books in and see if somebody wants to learn that crap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, for the first time this year, we have this thing uh, called Engineering Stories. So Ann Meixner is going to be around uh, Friday today from 1 to 5 and Saturday from 1 to 4. And essentially what she's doing is she's taking people's engineering stories, how they built something, what they're trying to build, and curating it on her blog, Engineering's Daughter, with the intention of this being you know, community involvement and community feedback on solving actual engineering problems or the struggles that one faces while trying to solve those problems. Um, she's trying to, you know, get, get questions curated uh, to pertain to certain communities, one of which, of course, is security since she's donating her time for B-sides. Um, and we'll take your stories and post them on her blog in, in such a way that you know reflects the struggles or the challenges that you've overcame in some of these engineering tasks. Um, all of that information is going to be in the event room and on the website. Um, and there, there will be a sign-up sheet. So she's going to be doing 20-minute slots of interviews. And we'll take you know a set amount of stories and actually post those on the blog. And we'll get the access to them as well. And we'll put them on the B-Sides website. So this is something that we've never tried before. It, has promise, but it's going to take people to actually go out and give those interviews and see how it goes with your story that you have to tell, because all of us have something to say. There's also coming back again this year, Lockpicking Village. So this was a thing that it wasn't necessarily known if it was going to happen, and then Kenny miraculously sent out to the mailing list, I think Thursday afternoon, that, hey, I'm going to be at B-Sides. Um, so this has been happening for you know several years, and it, the majority of hacker conferences there is you know a lockpick village happening. Um, so this is really really excellent to have, and kudos to Kenny and the Tool uh, Chapter of Portland for putting this on again this year. So those are the majority of the contests and events happening in the room, and now really 
and this is biased for me as somebody that was a part of the organization of the CTF and somebody that is really into hands-on skills, and I feel that CTF is a really excellent learning platform, both to practice offensive security skills and defensive security skills, which I'll talk about in my talk tomorrow. Um, but if you're not familiar, Capture the Flag is essentially a computer security competition, or is, if you watch Mr. Robot, uh, how he put it, Hacker Jeopardy, or, or the Hacker Olympics. So it's essentially you'll, you'll be presented with you know, a series of challenges, whether they're web, binary, forensics, reverse engineering. And the intent is to solve the challenge in such, the, in such a way that at the end you get a flag out. And then you cat that flag to a scoreboard and you get points. And the person with the most points is, you know, they win the CTF and they're the, they won the Hacker Olympics. Um, the unfortunate part about CTFs is at a lot of conferences, especially say bigger ones like DevCon, for example, the CTFs have a really, really difficult barrier to entry, and people feel discouraged from participating because they don't think that they have the skills in order to solve even the, you know, the basic 100 level challenges, because at these conferences, they're not basic. The whole idea behind B-Sides, uh, which was reflected by Joe during the opening ceremony, is this is an event for people that are new, they're incoming, it gives them an opportunity to voice their ideas and get started um, so we kind of take that notion and put it into the CTF. So these challenges are, you know, amateur to intermediate. There's nothing that should be that tricky or surprising to somebody that's new. And I, I say this not as, you know, if you're new and you can't solve these, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying it's a way that, you know, we have things like buffer overflows that have been existing since 1983 or whatever. And they're, they're not things that are meant to discourage you from playing and it's a really good way to gain skills that can take you further in your exploitation career. So this year we developed 16 challenges across four domains. So it's a four by four scoreboard. We have web, binary, exploitation, reverse engineering, and shellcode challenges. Um, speaking of, you know, useless books that you might not want to read, does anybody know how to, how to write MIPS? <laughs> You should play CTF because one of the shell coding challenges is MIPS. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so one of the hardest parts about CTF isn't necessarily the challenge writing. It's how you're going to host the challenges. So in the past, um, at some of the CTF events that have been ran at B-Sides, one year in 2015, we actually had you know a dedicated server sitting in the event room. It was all a local subnet, and you just connected to the server with you know the local network, and there was no internet access to it, which is cool. But then you know you can't go on Google and and try to get help from things and read you know the manual for for Pwn tools or whatever. So last year, what we wound up doing is Jesse and I at our old organization. Uh, wrote a series of challenges for the CWE Top 25, which are the top 25 most pertinent vulnerabilities across the software domain, including you know binary and web. And we, we took those and we're like, okay, let's make the B-Sides PDX CTF out of this, because this is very much driven to the, this is intermediate and amateur, and most people from reading these articles about these vulnerabilities that have been existing for years can solve them. But then it became the question of how do we actually host this infrastructure in such a way that it's, it's secure from when somebody gets, you know, root shell on a box or a shell on a box, they're limited to their exec capabilities and they don't tear down the infrastructure or we're giving them something unintended. So I reached out to my friend Andrew, who at the time was building a platform and they agreed to let us use it and sponsor the event. So we wound up using, if you played CTF last year, it was this really awesome platform from Symantec where it was fully isolated, every player was competing in their own you know, little sandbox, and it worked out really, really well. So going into this year, um, I, you know, DevCon time, knew I was gonna run the CTF, had no idea what the infrastructure was gonna look like, and of all things, we're sitting at the Flamingo um, in the cabana that Mozilla was hosting. And, you know, I'm talking about how last year's CTF was a huge success, and I didn't know what to do this year. But B-Side San Francisco did a really cool thing where they took a, a Kubernetes implementation and ran their whole entire challenge in Kubernetes. And the guy sitting next to me looked over, I'm the one that wrote that. <laughs> 
So I'm like, oh, wait, what? This is amazing. We should connect and talk. And he's like, yeah, and, you know, I kind of copied it from the Symantec platform. And Andrew's like, I wrote that. <laughs> so it became this whole little circle of, you know, it's a small world. Um, and people that are designing and hosting CTF somehow all wound up at the same cabana at the Flamingo. So we all coordinated with each other and wound up with this really awesome infrastructure platform this year. It's all deployed in AWS um, in Mozilla's instances, actually. And them being one of our platinum sponsors is totally wicked that we're able to host in them. And it's, it's Kubernetes. Everything is built with Docker, um, which we'll get into. You know, don't, don't fret. It's actually not that bad how we're doing it. Because you know, Docker security, oh my god, don't do that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to invite Yusuf up on stage from Mozilla. Um, and he's actually visiting from out of the country. They flew him here from London just to give, just to build our infrastructure for us and to give this little uh, section of the talk. So welcome, Yusuf. Hi, everybody. Um, I only have a few minutes. So this is going to be a very, um, a very, very quick run through of a lot of complex things. So um, take this more as a. Um, go forth and look at these after um, after this talk. But so yeah, um, running um, a CTF inside Docker doesn't sound like a great idea. So um, the, these are some of the things that um, we've worked on to, um, to sort of harden up the Kubernetes cluster in case um, the Docker security fails. So um, one of the first things and sort of the key um, the key security mechanism right now for Kubernetes is role-based access control. And so essentially, um, that's what it says on the tin. It's um, you define roles, and you combine it um, to various resources inside of Kubernetes. Um, and it allows controls. Um, it controls access to the API. And so um, by, by default, in um, earlier versions of Kubernetes, um, role-based access control isn't enabled by default. So anything running inside the cluster has complete administrator access to the API. And also by default in Kubernetes is anytime a pod, so um, a container or set of containers is deployed in Kubernetes, a um, service account token is mounted inside the pod that gives access to the API. So by default, um, every container inside the cluster has cluster level, cluster level administrator privileges. Um, which isn't great. So um, from Kubernetes 1.6 and later, um, it's enabled by default, but a lot of people end up disabling it because um, there are some services that don't support RBAC, like um, Helm, for instance, the package manager, or they just created their cluster um, before it was enabled by default. So if there's anything to take from, um, take from my section, it's just enable RBAC in your cluster or um, create it when you're creating your cluster. Um, the next big thing I'm going to talk about is um, container networking and the new network policy resource in, um, in Kubernetes. Um, by default, uh, Kubernetes uses KubeNet as its um, container networking overlay, which is sort of really simple. It, it, it does the basics. There are, is no sort of cross-node networking or um, network policy implementation. So um, for any production Kubernetes cluster, I just recommend using one of the um, other networking plugins like Calico, Weave, that kind of thing. Um, if you are using Calico uh, on AWS, um, just remember to change the uh, disable source destination checks. Otherwise, nothing will work, and you'll spend uh, half a day trying to figure out why. Um, yeah, and so another thing. The B-Sides infrastructure was um, created using KOPS, which made this thing super easy. So as you can see there, there's a simple flag to just enable Calico networking. You don't have to worry about um, anything inside the cluster. Same with RBAC. There's authentication equals RBAC. Super easy to do with KOPS. Um, we love it at Mozilla. So, and it covers a lot of use cases for most people who, who want to use Kubernetes. Um, and so yeah, Calico enable, um, implements the network policy. And so by default, um, there are no network policies defined, so all traffic can run inside of the cluster, which doesn't really um, help us much. So this is sort of a sample um, configuration network policy that will just deny all ingress traffic to all um, pods. And so that gives you a good starting point, and from there you can whitelist 
um, whitelist um, the networking you want to do. So this is on the left here, a super simple um, Nginx pod that exposes port 80. And on the right here, we have a network policy that simply put um, um, allows all traffic into port 80 on that, um, on that Nginx pod. And so when you get in, you can do more complex things with this as well. Um, so for instance, here we'd have a, um, a memcached pod and um, this network policy will allow it to um, allow the web um, pods to um, communicate with that. So instantly right there, we're separating out, um, we're isolating each of these services from each other. So in case one gets pwned, um, people won't be able to move across the applications inside the cluster. Um, some other things um, that I'm going to briefly touch on, not go into too much detail on these. Um, is the pod security policy admission controller. This lets you control um, what kind of docking containers can be run. The main use case for that is to disable host networking. Um, if, if somebody is able to um, deploy uh, pods inside of the cluster with host networking, completely bypasses all of that network policy stuff, so that all becomes a moot point. Um, the node restriction admissions controller. So one thing in... Um, Kubernetes is that kubelets, the nodes that run the containers, um, by default have access to all of sort of the secrets um, every service in the cluster needs to run. Um, the node restriction emission controller makes it so that um, only the the only the secrets that the kubelet is actually going to run it has access to, so it can't um, see everything inside of the cluster. So it's a least privilege. Um, using certificate authentication um, for Kubelets and etcd. Um, you can enable RBAC, but it doesn't really help much if people can just write and read the state of etcd directly. You can just bypass all of that role-based access. And specifically for AWS, your, pro your, um, your containers are probably going to interact with the um, other AWS services and um, the by, um, in AWS, you can only assign um, IAM permissions to an AWS instance, not by container, and the metadata proxy is able to sort of transparently assume different AWS roles for different containers. So you, you don't have to give a broad set of AWS permissions to all of the services running in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so yeah, I know that was a really big information dump, but I'd recommend going off searching um, all of this stuff if you're running or want to run a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and yeah, come talk to me um, if you have questions about this. Um, I believe now I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to talk about um, the fun prizes you can get um, if you manage to break the cluster. Thank you. So there's a, kind of one more thing about the CTF um, that we were able to add at the last minute. Um, so at Mozilla, we have this checklist of security principles. Um, before we put something into our production environment, there's uh, 12 and four categories, I think. And once uh, one of those things reaches that level of maturity, we put in what's called our core bug bounty program. Uh, who knows what a bug bounty is? Who likes cash? So uh, we've decided for B-side, since this is our reference implementation of Kubernetes uh, running these challenges in what we believe is our most secure configuration, that we will consider this cluster uh, in scope for our core bug bounty program. So if you can uh, pivot out of one of the B-side's challenges and you can hack the cluster itself, uh, please find me and I will connect you with our bug bounty people and you will get a substantial pile of cash. So uh, you have uh, my boss over there, Jeff Breiner, to thank for putting this in scope for the bug bounty program. So thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that we could be here and do the infrastructure for this event. Yeah, and I mean, as far as CTFs are concerned, right? I mean, you're giving people intentionally vulnerable challenges. And in some cases, especially for Ponable's category of challenges, the whole intent is to cap that flag when you're running commands as you know a user on a container. So there's been a lot of really fascinating talks about Kubernetes security, um, particularly stuff um, from Dino, 
uh, at Capsule 8. Uh, he, he did a talk recently at um, one of his security meetup groups in New York City where he showed in about eight minutes how if you have code exec on a, on a Kubernetes pod, like a Docker container, basically in five commands, you own the whole entire environment. So the whole notion of this, particularly around the bug bounty, is that should not be possible in this. And if you get code exec in one of the challenges, which is intentional, you shouldn't be able to do anything more than that. Um, so we're really stoked about the infrastructure this year. We believe it's as secure as can be for a CTF where you, know, you don't necessarily have to be a good developer to write CTF challenges because the whole intent is they are hackable. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. With that said though, there are a lot of things as a challenge organizer that we could have done a lot better. So one thing in particular is you'll notice, and I'll, I'll mention this in a little bit, but we're going to open source all of the challenges, including the infrastructure code. And you'll notice that some of the code is, you know, slopped together, uh, which, you know, whatever, like I said, you don't have to be a good developer in order to write CTF, which is great. But one of the things we're doing is like using XINET D, which of course we all know is old and deprecated because system D ate everything. But at the same time, but it's system D. <laughs> So we didn't use that this year, but we can in the future. And you know, if you look at how CTFs are kind of modeled, a lot of challenges that people write will be modeled after something else that they've attacked or exploited, whether or not you're you know, in a pen test role or a red team role. A lot of the ideas and inspiration for challenges you as a content developer come up with are things that you've previously done, which makes it really interesting. And you know, if you go on the internet, a lot of stuff is still running XINET D, so this is totally legit. Another thing is starting earlier in the year. Uh, so like I said, this a lot of the inspiration for this really came from randomly meeting people at DevCon at the Cabana, especially the infrastructure side. And we hadn't necessarily planned from an organizational perspective how many challenges we wanted to do and who was going to write them. Um, and I actually got an email. Uh, Eric wound up talking to Joe, I think, or Dean and was, I want to help out with the CTF at B-Sides this year. Who do I talk to? And I got you know, an email in my inbox. It took about a month to actually meet up and go over what the intent was, which is going into another thing to do better, which is more organizers and organization. So other than the infrastructure side, which we were pretty hands off with, uh, it was two people that wrote all 16 challenges, which if you look at, say, other CTF teams, there's a lot more than two people doing the, doing the work. And in a lot of cases, particularly, say, what LegitBS was doing at DevCon, they treated it as a second full-time job, which, of course, we didn't necessarily have the resources nor manpower to do so. And having lives is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> it can be. There, there was a comment that it's kind of overrated, which, yeah, I mean, what's life, right? Um, but there's, you know, certainly room to improve for organizers and organization of the event before it actually happens at B-Sides. Um, so if you want to, you know, get involved with organization or you feel that you have a really unique idea for a challenge and you want to contribute, come talk to me um, and we can make that happen for next year. I'll also probably do a better job and actually have, you know, comms reached out, whether or not it be on Twitter or the B-Sides PDX Google group to get some more assistance with this. Um, and then, of course, uh, continue to improve our Kubernetes cluster and our AWS infra. Um, I anticipate this going really well this weekend, and I hope that we can utilize Mozilla for next year uh, from the infrastructural standpoint. Also, you'll notice, and this is sad because we had this epiphany this morning as we were setting up, there's no live scoreboard. <laughs> oh, how did we not think of this? Um, so. I want to get Eric up here um, just so people can see, see him because he put in a, a substantial amount of work with me uh, this year. And he reached out to me. I didn't reach out to him. And without his help, I don't think I would have been able to do 16 challenges and get all of the infrastructure and organization done by myself. So Eric wanted to say something really quickly about that. Yeah, just a few quick comments. Um, like Topher said in the beginning, a lot of CTF challenges have a really high barrier to entry. With this one in particular, uh, we really went for breadth over depth. So if you're a person who's maybe heard of SQL injection or heard of a buffer overflow or wants to do things that normally might uh, get you a CFAA investigation, this is the time and place to do it. If you're new, we really encourage you uh, to reach out to one of us. We'll probably be at the CTF table or somewhere around here, and, uh, and we can help you get started. Uh, we're friendly. We don't bite. 
And uh, really encourage you, if you've never done a CTF before, this is a great contest to start. So that's all. Thanks. And then, of course, big thanks again to the Mozilla team and them hosting the infrastructure and getting our Kubernetes cluster for us and the surprise bug bounty program for their core bug bounty, which is totally awesome. Um, so one thing that doesn't necessarily happen after a CTF event is organizers will, you know, they'll make, uh, they'll, they'll put their events on a repository and have people contribute write-ups for how people solve challenges, but nobody necessarily publishes source for how those challenges were created. Um, and I think that's a shame. I think that sharing as an organizer the, uh, the challenges that were created, showing, showcasing, you know, how I thought a particular vulnerability worked and how I wanted it to be exploited is valuable to bring the community forward, both from a learning how not to write code, or if you are an organizer, learning how to write vulnerable code intentionally, and then also showing, you know, if somebody is completely stuck and they're trying to solve challenges afterwards, which with this you'll be able to do. Everything is going to be a, a single Docker compose command to bring everything up locally on, on your box after the event. Um, it's really useful to have source. And I want to you know, try to get a movement started within the CTF organization space of people publishing source after their events. Um, also, of course, there's awesome prizes this year for the CTF, so be sure to come to closing ceremonies. I'll do statistics of how many teams played, how many solves there were there. Um, and that sort of thing. Also, like I said, if you want to be involved next year, whether or not it be with planning, challenge writing, or uh, helping out with infrastructure, please reach out to me. I would love help, and I would love to get this going as a bigger event at B-Sides every year. So yeah, come play CTF. It's in the event room. We have dedicated Wi-Fi, B-Sides PDX CTF party. <laughs> There's also a series of evening activities happening throughout this, throughout this conference. So last night, as you've heard, there were a bunch of hackers meeting up at Control H where we assembled all the badges. I play tested some of the CTF to make sure the environment was still stable after we uh, made our Kubernetes cluster a little bit better last night. Um, but with that said, they're one of our sponsors. Thursday nights are always open house. Wednesday nights, Dean leads a thing called Exploit Workshop, and it's usually a pretty good turnout of people just hacking on stuff and exploiting things. Um, like, you know, if you're familiar with the crack vulnerability that just came out, play, people were just playing around with that willy-nilly and having fun and seeing how vulnerable their phones were that'll never get patched. <laughs> <laughs> also tonight, um, Technology Diversified is hosting an after party at Pascal. This is a new hacker space in the area. It's fairly recent, and they're going to have things like retro games, lock picking, badge hacking, music, hacker bingo. And then they're also going to have a couple of tables to further play the CTF event. Um, there's, there's a meetup page for it. It's linked to on the website, at, you know, the events page for contests. And really, the event begins at 6.30, so, you know, go get your drink on. <laughs> Tomorrow night, there's also going to be another after party. Um, of course, everybody's going to be really tired, especially those that organize the event. But, you know, there's always room for drinking. <laughs> So there'll be another event at Control H between 8 and 10, um, over, which isn't that far from here. You can literally just hop on the max yellow line. It drops you off right at the front door. Um, and that's the end of the slide deck. Um, I don't know if people wanted to ask questions. Totally open for that. In the spirit of this being a 101 talk and nothing you know, being rehearsed and do it live mentality, <laughs> we did it live. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the closing ceremonies are at 4, it will be done around 4.30, and then I will get push. <laughs> so tonight, or tomorrow night. Yeah, it'll be pretty instant. Everything's already ready. We had it on Bitbu Bitbucket um, because, you know, they support private repos for free. Because GitHub, you know, for some reason likes to charge people lots of money to have open source things. Um, so yeah, it'll be available tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> uh, I will. I will clean up all the swear words in the schematics, and then I will push them to get, and I'll tweet it out. Um, I should do that soon, like maybe after this. <laughs> uh, also, um, the. Also, we'll have the schematics, the uh, source 
file, the source for uh, flashing this and like a rough series of instructions. Basically, uh, you need the NR the NRF SDK to blow the bootloader, but that if you wedge your bootloader, but that's already done. But this is a NRF Arduino project, so if you just download the Arduino uh, NRF fifty uh, X because it's fifty one fifty and fifty two um, SDK, well not the Arduino runtime for it, then uh, you can flash it directly through the UR connector on the back. Yay! <laughs> cool. Will there be spare parts for those that are not produced? I'll publish a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks everybody for coming to B Sides. Enjoy all the presentations, enjoy the events and contests, enjoy the parties, and let's hack the planet together. <laughs>